Hello, everybody. I'm pleased to have with me today one of the world's great biologists, Dr. Randy Thornhill. He's an evolutionary biologist and distinguished professor of biology emeritus at the University of New Mexico, with a primary interest in animal behavior and psychology, as well as human behavior and psychology. Dr. Thornhill and his colleagues have authored or co-authored about 250 scientific publications, including four research monographs or books. His publications have been cited in the scientific literature more than 35,000 times. A citation score is the number of times a reference to a given piece of research is cited by another researcher or in another publication by the same author. A scientific citation count in the tens of thousands clearly indicates that a researcher occupies a position in the upper echelons of scientific influence. Dr. Thornhill is a founder of the research disciplines of behavioral ecology, evolutionary psychology, evolutionary aesthetics. So that's the study of the experience of beauty from an evolutionary perspective. Evolution and human behavior, the modern study of adaptation, and the study of sexual coercion. Dr. Thornhill, thank you very much for agreeing to talk to me today. Thank you for inviting me. Pleasure to be here. Thank you. Thank you. So I've come across your research a number of times in my career, struck by its uh, its originality and and its impact. I, I'd like to ask you first about something I, I probably ran into, maybe it's 20 years ago, maybe it's 15, something like that. You did some work on the perception of attractiveness, bilateral symmetry, averageness, and sexual selection. Can you outline what you found and why? Yes, um, I did work um, some years ago now in uh, uh, human uh, attractiveness and um, that turned out to to be very uh, productive about attractiveness in general in animals. And one of the key uh, traits that animals look at in judging uh, physical attractiveness of, of partners, of mates, is uh, bilateral symmetry. And uh, a colleague and I in the early 90s uh, came up with a way to measure uh, facial symmetry in humans. It had been uh, worked on before, and but the measurements that they used were uh, didn't work. Uh, so we came up with a with a method that did work, measuring bilateral symmetry in the face. So that is the symmetry of the two sides of the face. Why is that important, and why is it a marker for attractiveness? It turns out that that bilateral symmetry is a measure of developmental health, and so the the organism. Uh, when it starts developing, it's designed by evolution, by selection, to, to uh, achieve a bilaterally symmetric form. You can think of that, it, this is the case, when I say organisms, I mean all forward moving organisms. All forward moving organisms uh, have, uh, have, have adaptations, developmental adaptations to achieve a bilaterally symmetric body because, first of all, that reduces drag. So if you're moving forward and you're bilaterally symmetric, you don't have any drag in your movement. You can think about a person with a, a leg uh, a bit shorter than the other, and there's drag in the, move, in the forward movement. The more of that asymmetry, the more drag. So you lose efficiency in movement. That's fundamental to what bilateral symmetry is about. But next, bilateral symmetry is very hard. Perfect bilateral symmetry is very, very hard to achieve by development. So it's a marker of quality of the individual pertaining to its developmental health. We see in many things that human beings design to move forward bilateral symmetry. Cars or automobiles are bilaterally symmetrical. Airplanes are bilaterally symmetrical. Yeah. So we like our world like to be that way. Yeah, we like our world to be that way. Actually, it turns out. And, and um, well, and you're car, associating it with the, the same market. principle. If you had if you had one side of the car uh, asymmetric compared to the other side of the car, then there'd be more drag. You know, it's not an efficient. You'd, you'd use more gas. Think about it that way. Uh, in driving down the road with an asymmetric car. Um, but so this, this is one component of physical attractiveness, bilateral symmetry. And we looked first, when we developed this uh, way to measure <clears throat> facial symmetry, 
uh, that became a, a, a very hot research topic. We did the first and then others followed very quickly. And lots and lots of research has been done now, but there's you know symmetry of movement that's important in, in how fluid one's movement is and how attractive therefore one's movement is. You're not dragging your foot or whatever. And um, all that is really a, a component of the importance of health in physical attractiveness. So physical attractiveness fundamentally is a health certification. That's how we judge uh, people's attractiveness. We don't think about it consciously. It's an unconscious calculation of the traits important in uh, health. And developmental health as bilateral symmetry is one of these. So you measure the symmetry of the two sides of the face, and we showed in our first study of this way back now that um, that measurement uh, relates to how attractive faces are perceived, Try faces of the same sex or opposite sex. And then that research went on to look at uh, kids looking at faces and uh, eth different ethnic groups looking at faces. It works like a charm wherever you do it. There are lots and lots of research. And so does it mean that if you show people symmetrical or asymmetrical faces that they obviously have a preference for the symmetrical faces. Will they yeah. look longer at the symmetrical faces? Will infants look longer at symmetrical faces? Yes, they do. Yeah, and, that's and the way the infant infant beauty research is done. You just look at whether the, whether the baby, and they got it down now to almost newborns, you know, looking at faces and um, judging these faces basically on the basis of interests, how long they look at the face versus getting distracted to something else. And symmetry is one part, part of the uh, beauty, whether you're talking about babies or kids or old people or young people or whatever, facial symmetry is, is very important. It's not the only beauty marker in the face we look at. We can talk about that in a moment too, because that gets us into uh, some other research we've done. But symmetry is a very important one. Now that research went on to look at how symmetry plays out in the everyday lives of people. And we did uh, the initial studies on that, but again, that, that research bloomed and uh, lots of people are, uh, have done it and still it's an active part of uh, research. But the first thing we did, not just attractiveness, we did a bunch of that in relation to symmetry, but we looked at uh, sex lives of uh, people, romantically paired people, uh, studies of uh, couples and um, looked at uh, looked at uh, re uh, reports by men and women of sex partner number that they've had in their lifetime. Uh, that was one component of it because that's that's a that's a measure in men in particular of uh, what biologists call mating success. So number of number of uh, sexual partners one has, and uh, that that research showed that for men, uh, the more symmetric the man, uh, the more sex partners he had. And a technical detail there, after we, we you know, initially started with facial symmetry, but then we moved to the body of people. We came up with a metric for body symmetry, measuring 11 traits on both sides of the body. These traits are um, ear length and ear width, um, and, and then we measure elbow, there's some elbow anatomy there that we measure, some bones, wrists, fingers, all those men measure, of course, on both sides, measure foot width, ankle width, trace like that. And then we put that together in a composite as a measure of body bilateral symmetry. That correlates highly with facial symmetry because the symmetry is a developmental health measure throughout the body. And um, that correlates with uh, mating success of men. A more, more symmetric men are physically more attractive and they have more sex partners. Uh, we also got into um, looking at men's infidelities in their relationships and found that more symmetric men uh, engage in more uh, matings outside the pair bond as well. So that's, that's part of their mating success. We did uh, the first study of um, uh, kind of modern study, we would call it, of uh, female orgasm 
uh, in relate in 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 uh, uh, copulatory orgasm. Uh, so in part, looking at women, uh, 200 romantically paired couples and asking the women about their orgasm patterns during mating with their partner and separately asking the men. And we found that the men's reports and the women's reports of frequency of copulatory orgasm by the women were very highly correlated. So men are paying attention to this phenomenon of whether the female is sexually aroused to the zenith level of orgasm, of course. And uh, more symmetric men were firing uh, more copulatory orgasms too. That was a very classic study in human So I have a specific question about that. Yeah. I've always wanted to ask a biologist interested in sexual behavior, but I know that there's been a lot of discussion about the hypothetical evolutionary purpose of female orgasm. And I was wondering if female orgasm is disproportionately likely to trigger, trigger male orgasm. Because it could be, it could be an yeah. adaptation that's used to elicit pregnancy, essentially. Yeah, I don't think it is. It's there's no there's there's no evidence that females that orgasm very infrequently have fewer babies, and actually, women who don't ever orgasm can be quite fertile. So I don't think it's fundamentally that. I think what it is is it's part of female mate choice and more, and more basically sire choice of the female. Let me explain. So when a female uh, has an orgasm, uh, she has uterine contraction, of course, and that pull, it works like a suction. It pulls the uh, content of the vagina up to the cervix. So it puts the, puts the content of the vagina in a good place. And if that content includes the male's ejaculate, then she's pulling the male's ejaculate up to the cervix where it's easier for him to get, you know, easier for the ejaculate to get into the right place to conceive. So if she, imagine a female who has two mating partners. She orgasms with one, pulling his ejaculate up to the cervix, and she skips orgasm with the other partner. So she, in effect, is mated with both men. So that is, you know, same mating success of the two men, if you just look at mating success. But she's doing something more subtle that is differentially affecting the fertilizing capacity of the ejaculate of the two men. The, man, the ejaculate she pulls up has more potential for fertilization. And that's a component of cryptic female choice. So uh, in the 80s, I discovered uh, what I labeled as cryptic female choice, first in insects, and then uh, it, it applied to f uh, female uh, orgasm uh, too in, in, uh, in humans. As a, in cryptic female choice is, is just the, the kind of female choice that is invisible if you're only measuring mating success. So in the example we talked about, the two guys mating with this female had the same mating success, they both mated with her. But one had, was, was preferred over the other by the female's orgasmic capacity with him that pulled his ejaculate up. And so females, by showing this differential uh, um, orgasm pattern that I described with symmetry, are favoring symmetric partners over other men. And hypothetically healthier partners and, and I mean, hypothetically yeah, providing their kids partners, with, an, right. with an advantage. Higher, that's right, higher genetic quality. And then that's, that's an issue behind all this discussion so far is that uh, female organisms uh, are after uh, high genetic quality partners when they're, when they're, you know, to be fathers of their offspring. So it's a sire choice, more the a cryptic female choice is more of a sire choice than just a mate choice. And Darwinian, Dar Darwin, Charles Darwin discovered uh, female choice and did a lot with it for sure. And biologists had viewed um, female choice in a Darwinian framework up until very recently, until cryptic female choice came along. But females are far more sophisticated than just choosing one male over another as a mate. They do, they do these subtle things and involved in cryptic choice to prefer some 
uh, the uh, sperm of some mates over the sperm of others. Whole suite of now that's, that's a big area. Of, well, what uh, other elements are? What other elements make up cryptic choice? You you described well, the orgasm. In, what else? Uh, what else? My disco flies? first discovery was was in uh, some insects called scorpion flies, and what the females do there is they adjust mating duration. And hence the amount of ejaculate that the male transfers. There's no orgasm in these insects, but the longer the male can mate, the long, the bigger his the the more sperm he transfers to the female. So females are adjusting ejaculate duration on the basis of body size of the male. So and by, bigger males are more fit males and so forth, better growth and uh, more resources growing up. They're higher quality males. The females are receiving more sperm from bigger males. That's one thing I did with these insects. Another was the female, after she mates with a male, makes a choice of whether to lay eggs or not. If she chooses to lay eggs, then she will fertilize, we you know from other research I've done, she will fertilize those eggs with the last male sperm she mated with. So if she makes the decision to lay eggs, she's going to use that last male sperm. She, and, and large males, again, uh, are preferred in that component of cryptic female choice. So cryptically, these female scorpion flies are preferring large-bodied males by both uh, receiving more sperm from them and making decisions to lay eggs uh, with them and not other males. So those kind of subtle things that uh, females do that aren't apparent if you're just measuring classical male mating success, you know. And is symmetry in, in human beings, is it associ it's associated with longevity? Is it associated with decreased probability of disease in the future? Is it associated with higher general cognitive ability? Like, are there other factors that... For cognitive ability, we did that. We did that research, and that's that. Would, there have been uh, three or four repetitions of our initial research. We did it on two hundred uh, subjects, uh, similar age, so university students, the psych pool kind of study, and um, measured uh, measured IQ uh, using a culture fair measure of IQ, culture fair uh, procedure and uh, uh, questionnaire measured the IQ and then measured the symmetry in it for both sexes. The uh, higher the symmetry of the individual, the higher the IQ. So- Do you remember you know, the size of the relationship by any that chance? Was, that one was about 0.3. It's a, it's a moderate uh, relationship for IQ. Um, the, you know, there's measurement error in IQ, measuring IQ. There's measurement error in measuring developmental stability as symmetry too. Uh, so, you know, we measured 10, 11 traits. If we measured 50 traits, presumably we would get a correlation of, say, 0 0.8 with IQ. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. all that measurement. Mm -hmm. uh, and, the, and the IQ relationship would exist hypothetically because the healthier individual would be prone to a, a more favorable pattern of, of neurological development over the course correct. of life that's history. The that's the idea, exactly. The, uh, some colleagues went on to look at uh, some brain features in relation to developmental stability of the outer body. So they did uh, 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 imaging, uh, brain imaging studies to look at certain brain parts. Some brain parts are bilaterally asymmetric by design. So one bigger on one side than corpus callosum. Well, the corpus callosum is a tube, you know, that connects the two hemispheres. That's just a size factor, but you can measure the size of that circumference of the uh, corpus callosum as they did. And the bigger the bigger the tube, the higher the uh, body symmetry of the person. Bigger the corpus callosum. They measured a couple of other brain parts too, and showing that. Um, showing that, uh, so you can talk about a modal directionality for an asymmetric trait. So there's a, there's a mode, the most common degree of asymmetry in an asymmetric trait. So like handedness and so forth. Uh, six is, you know, the average person or the modal person, 60% right, 40% left hand use. You can measure deviation from that 
as another measure of developmental instability. And that was the mm -hmm. kind of thing they did with the brain parts, these asymmetric brain parts. So that's things. that's deviation from averageness in a sense. In a sense, yeah. And so you, now really. you also did work on averageness and detractiveness. Did some stuff on the averageness, but we're really just to control it because uh, you can do average facial uh, features, you know, nose size, eye size, lip size, uh, measurements of the face. Right, and, and people have built composites of faces to produce yeah, average and faces and had people rate them. Average, averageness, average faces is a tr more attractive than non-average. However, average is not the, op the most attractive face. The most attractive faces deviate from average in predictable ways. You want to talk about it? Sure, yes. Okay. <laughs> so I've seen the... averaged models' faces, and they seem more attractive than averaged faces. And maybe that yeah, pertains well, to yeah, this. but you can you can you can take a model, and you can make you know make her a knock drop dead. Mm -hmm. by, by, the, the, by the following computer manipulations. <laughs> what you do, if she's a female model, not a male model, if she's a female model, you do the estrogen modifications on her, on her face through computer techniques. So you, you reduce basically lower face size, chin size, jaw size, those kinds of things that are under estrogen control during puberty and adolescence. And for a male face, you manipulate in the opposite direction. So male faces are more attractive when testosteroneized, not estrogenized. And female faces are more attractive when estrogenized. So the female model, facial models get their get their job because they're highly estrogenized faces. And are they uh, neotenous? The female attractive faces? Are they more neotenous? Yeah, they're more neotenous in the sense of. So, so uh, a, a woman who makes her living with her face, uh, face model, her face is about the size, lower face is about the same size as a 10, 11 year old girl. So neoteny in that sense. So, so neoteny is the tendency of an, uh, an organism to evolve towards its childhood uh, appearance. morphology. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah and so, yeah. okay, so neotenous, uh, neotenous averaged females are more attractive yeah. And so now is that just out of curiosity, do you think that the attractiveness of that neoteny is a consequence of the ability of the more childlike face to elicit care from a male? Yeah, elicit care and interest and, you know, attractiveness. So basically, here's the way we think it works. So the so the neoteny we're talking about, we could talk about it just as degree of estrogenization of the face. That's what we measure. Um, that is a marker of health in a different sense, hormonal health. So estrogen. Estrogen is fundamentally the fertility and reproductive capability hormone of the female uh, mammal, estrogen. So the more estrogenized she is, the greater her fertility and reproductive capacity is. So that's what we're responding to in the physical attractiveness of a female. Is there, is there an association between averaged neotenous faces and optimal waist to hip ratio? Yeah. Well, the, yeah, the, the estrogenization affects not only the facial features, it affects bones and so forth. So, you know, uh, petite, people talk about petite women. Uh, as, as attractive. She's so petite and so forth. What they're talking about is estrogenization of the bones throughout the body, not just the face. But, uh, and that includes the, uh, the waist hip ratio is really a marker uh, of degree of estrogenization of the female body, low waist hip ratio. So a small waist relative to a more expanded hips, the smaller the waist relative to the hips is a marker of uh, estrogenization of the female body. And that again is a, is a marker of female reproductive capacity through the estrogen effect. Yeah. And that's optimal at about 0.68? Is that, is that research? Yeah, that'd be, yeah you're, you're, you know, uh, underwear models, female underwear models, they're down, they could go as low as 0.66. 
a 0.68, you can uh, be a model. <laughs> yeah. So what other elements of attractive? Okay, so a couple of things here. So the first thing that's really quite interesting is that your work points to, or this work, this, this entire line of work points to a profound biological basis for the uh, experience of aesthetic attraction, at least in relationship to the perception of other people and, uh, of course, the perception of ourselves. You're right. That's, a tremendous amount of that's grounded in instinct, apparently. Yeah. And it's, yeah. it's an instinct that's manifest so early that you see the preference for attractive faces, say, measured by averageness in newborns. Do you see the same preference for testosteroneized males and estrogenized females among newborns, or has anyone looked at that? Yeah, uh, yeah, uh, kids and down to uh, very recently born kids have been looked at in terms of their judgment of men's faces too. And that's, they're looking at testosterone features there, mask, you know, you could call it masculinity would be the common, but testosterone technically. And um, these features that grow under the influence of testosterone during puberty and adolescence. Uh, in the male and in the female, they're growing under the influence of estrogen. Basically, estrogen just capping the growth of those facial bones and the other bones too. And to, but testosterone, along with growth hormone, promotes the growth of the same bones in the face and body of the man. And uh, so babies are judging men's faces the same as you and I or a person off the street would. Uh, that's what the that's what the research shows. Yeah. This was promoted. There's a book called The Beauty Myth, for example, that purports to claim that conceptions of female beauty are, what would you say, uh, arbitrary social constructions. What yeah. do you think about that idea? How, pow how powerful is the biological impulse towards aesthetic it's, experience? It's the, it's the, it's the reality. The, bio <laughs> the biological research I'm referring to has been so abundant since the uh, really starting in the 90s that what really kicked it off was uh, the stuff we did initially on symmetry. And then, mm -hmm. then, then researchers got into the hormone markers, uh, beauty markers involving hormonal health. And uh, then most recently there's been, there's been another drive to look at uh, uh, some pigment issues uh, in terms of a beauty marker, a carotenoid pigment uh, in particular. But it's all health. Uh, it's all health. And the beauty myth gal, I forgot her name. Naomi uh, Klein. Yeah, right. Um, that was just uh, just blank ideology ranting. Yeah, had nothing to do with reality. And, and then there was enough known about uh, sexual selection processes and uh, animals to cast that idea and you know and uh, in doubt but since then it's just uh, it's right well because you see this per the preferences that you've been describing you see analogs of those and variants of them across the entire animal kingdom oh, and yeah. you see the preference in newborns so it's pretty right. hard to construct a social constructionist view of the aesthetic experience of attractiveness given all that information right well the first study on symmetry that i did uh, the role of symmetry in sexual selection uh, competition for mates and mate choice that was done on insects at the same time unknown to me uh, a dane a danish biologist was studying barn swallows and tail symmetry and barn swallows and we co-discovered this uh, role of symmetry and sexual selection independently he was working on barn swallows in europe i was working on scorpion flies uh, and then I, I got into humans too, but uh, yeah. And then following that, uh, biologists working on all kinds of critters, you know, looked at the symmetry paradigm in their um, in their uh, favorite study animal. And uh, I think by nineteen, let's see, about nineteen ninety seven, ninety eight, seventy five species of animals that have been shown in which symmetry plays an important role in the sexual selection system of the animals, yeah. So it's very robust, say the least. <laughs> so, so fundamentally, we find, we, we use markers of attractiveness for, for across both sexes to indicate 
general health and more than health? Is it also an indicator of general competence? It's associated yeah. with general yeah. cognitive ability. What about it. personality markers? Has anybody looked at that? Like are, are people who are symmetrical, are they less likely to be high in negative emotion, for example? Or are we, there look, any we look for it. Um, the guy did most of the research on sex and symmetry in humans. He's a, he's a, a psychologist and um, you know, works in a psychology department. I'm a psychologist too, but I don't work in a psychology department. But, um, and we got right into looking at personality, thinking it might correlate with personality and nothing, and others have tried it too. So it's not a, it's, symmetry is not a, a part of the personality paradigm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's not, it's not obvious that, that there's an optimal personality. Perhaps that's part of it is that there seems to be niches for personality that are useful for all sorts of different personalities. I mean, it looks all things considered like higher general cognitive ability is better across multiple yeah. domains, but it's not so obvious with personality. So maybe that's part of the reason that's not so robust. I was wondering more with se sensitivity to negative emotion because I thought maybe that less healthy people would be higher in trait neuroticism and that might show up with symmetry, but you haven't found anything like yeah. that. No, we, we didn't, we didn't find anything that was convincing there. I, I see what you're saying though, that, that would be a reasonable prediction to get into. And in the personality domain, we can get into that when we start talking about the parasite stress. Yeah. So let's, let's move into the parasite stress theory now. Before, Apart before we do, let me, before we do, uh, let me just summarize the beauty thing in, in Great. two minutes. Great. So the current knowledge, the reality about uh, our judgments of physical attractiveness, uh, empiric empirically based uh, knowledge, the only kind of knowledge that is real knowledge, but empirically based knowledge of how we judge physical attractiveness in terms of facial and bodily attractiveness is we use health markers. And those health markers are developmental stability that's symmetry, hormonal health, that's another one, and senescence is a third. So as we age, uh, we lose attractiveness, of course, and, and we lose function, uh, too. And so we pay attention to age and senescence effects when we judge attractiveness, of course. So symmetry, hormonal uh, effects, and, um, and senescence. Uh, then the final one, this, the most recent marker of physical attractiveness uh, that has been discovered is the uh, carotenoid pigment uh, thing, and it's pretty wild. Um, so carotenoids, you, you can't make. We don't, animals don't make carotenoids. We get them from diet. We, we eat uh, carotenoid-based foods or... Um, or animals that have eaten carotenoid-based food. So you get, you get all of our carotenoids, and the carotenoids are very important in metabolism. So um, fundamental to metabolism. You gotta have a lot of carotenoids. If you've got a lot of carotenoids, then you, and you've got excess carotenoids, you put those carotenoids in your skin, and they're the yellow colors in skin, and the yellow tints in skin and doesn't have anything to do with uh, what your, uh, uh, what your racial background is or whatever. You, there's, there's yellowness in the skin of uh, African-Americans, uh, Caucasians or uh, whatever, Asians, there's yellow pigment there. The degree of yellow is important in attractiveness. We assess it when we look at, when we look at faces. The more yellow, the more carotenoid the person has, the more excess the carotenoid the person has can put it in their skin. And what carotenoid says is that you have to, you have, to have a healthy gut to absorb carotenoid. It's fat soluble. You can't absorb fat if your gut's uh, sick. So it's uh, the yellowness in skin is a uh, is a marker, another marker of health that we use, and that's only been discovered in the last fifteen years or so. As I'm from, from what foods are carotenoids derived? Uh, your fruits and vegetables for the you know they're full of carotenoids, so you want to eat a lot of those. 
uh, and you get so. Is it also a marker of your ability to provision yourself? Well, that too, but you can provision yourself with anything, and you know it doesn't show up in your skin. Right. So, but that's yeah. not a higher quality marker of provisioning, no. and it's it's no, it's, it's, the, a, it's the, a sign the, of of metabolic health. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If you're if you're you know healthy uh, body looking and stuff, that that's a that's a that's a good indicator. But this is specifically. Uh, related to your overall gut health and allow, you know. So the, is it reasonable to say now that we know enough about the biology of attractiveness that we could build an optimally attractive form purely based on the scientific data per pertaining to health markers? Yeah, that's what so you we, do. We'd, we'd look Wait, at ankle measurements and, we'd, and symmetry and take, look at waist to hip can, ratio. I can take a female, I can take a female model, famous facial model, and take that face, digitize that face into the computer, like off the cover of Cosmopolitan or wherever. And I've done this. And I can make that make her even more attractive through, uh, through reducing uh, the uh, increasing the estrogenization components of her face. I can make her more attractive. Then she so if I, if I want to be particularly successful on Tinder, I'd put up a representation of my face, but I'd make it bilaterally symmetrical. So I could duplicate maybe the left side of my face. I'd, yeah. I'd make my skin yellower. Yeah, make your skin a little yellower. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, you can do it. I mean, the, the last, the most recent research on the yellowness thing, the grindness thing, is people would uh, do, you do, they did experiments where uh, they put people on different diets and, and they measure their, you know, take their facial picture before the experiment and six weeks after, in six weeks, you can improve your facial attractiveness by carotenoid, uh, including more carotenoid in your, in your diet. So it can be pretty quick. And students love this when we talk about it in class, of course, and tell, I'm telling them how to get prettier in a hurry. <laughs> yeah. All right, so let's move to, to, to the next major topic. I came across your work on parasite stress theory a few years ago. I started to get interest. There was a burgeoning literature on the role of disgust in political uh, ideation. Yeah. And I ran across your parasite stress theory. And so, and you were looking to begin with at the relationship between parasite stress and values. And so maybe we could delve first of all into well, what parasite stress is and how you would study that in relationship to value and why you would ever think to do that because it's by no means obvious. Okay. So the parasite stress, what we call the parasite stress theory of values. Uh, we also call it the parasite stress theory of sociality. Uh, it is, a, is a scientific theory. Uh, about how people get their values. So the causes of people's values. And the theory is um, a theory about both proximate causation and ultimate causation. So in biology, there are two general categories of causation, proximate and ultimate. Proximate causation has to do with causes of something that occurred during the lifetime of the uh, animal. Uh, events during the lifetime that cause whatever effect you're looking at. That's proximate causes. Ultimate causation has to do with causes in the deep time past, evolutionary past. So ultimate equal evolutionary, proximate equal causes um, during the lifetime of the individual. And this theory of um, parasite stress theory of values is both approximate and ultimate theory about how we get our causes. So let's tar start with the proximate level of causation of our values and what I mean by values. So that's, that's a, kind of a big topic. Uh, if you look at the history of research on values, um, it, is, it, it, is, uh, it is very large, but we could think we could, and, and almost uh, unbounded, what psychologists have called uh, values. But so a they, value would be something like rank ordered preference, if we're going to yeah, define value right. itself, right? Because well, we have to choose between things and we choose value. those things. That's, yeah, that's value. Okay, yep. so we, we were talking about the value people place on 
and looking at one face versus another. That's a value. That's a preference. Right. And they'll donate more attentional resources to high value faces because attention right. is a marker of value. Right. But we can talk about what psychologists have called values and the study of values. And that's a big, big area of research, values research. And uh, the history of it and all is really, really cool. But anyway, but we could we could sort of bound this discussion of values in what political scientists uh, refer to as values. And what they refer to as values is the political dimension of uh, highly conservative to highly liberal. So it's a continuum of values. And you can measure uh, a person's values. They've worked hard to come up with ways to measure uh, a person's values. You measure a person's values, you can put that person on that continuum somewhere. Everybody can be put on that continuum from a uh, psychometric procedure, questionnaires. That, so the political scientists have done values that way. Cross-cultural psychologists have done values in terms of collectivism and individualism, that dimension, with collectivism, high collectivism being low individualism, high individualism being low uh, collectivism. And it turns out, if you look at these two dimensions, so one from uh, psychology, collectivism, individualism, one from political science, uh, conservatism, liberalism, they correspond. So high collectivism is conservatism. High liberalism is individualism. And uh, so you can, you can think about the, what I'm talking about in terms of core values by those, those two dimensions, the uh, conservatism, liberalism, and collectivism, individualism. And basically, as I show, uh, they are, as we show, uh, that those, those uh, measures, uh, those dimensions are very, very similar, if not identical. Could you take them apart a little bit and talk about collectivism, conservatism, and, and liberalism, individualism, so everybody knows? Really I will well. indeed. Yeah. Okay, excellent. Yeah. So uh, you measure these, you measure these, uh, a person's collectivism said differently, you measure his or her individualism. And uh, uh, you're, what you're measuring, so let's talk, let's talk, start first with, with conservatism. So uh, a conservative person has sub, their sub components of this value system. So the person has believes uh, importantly in traditional things, traditional things and parochial things, local. Uh, also the person is uh, relatively xenophobic. Uh, if you know, conservative people are relatively xenophobic and xenophobia is fear, dislike, avoidance of stuff on the outside, foreigners, people, new ideas. So xenophobia has a neophobia component. Neophobia means phobia about the new. So you like traditional stuff. You don't like new, you don't like foreign. That's a xenophobia component. So conservatives uh, have, uh, have the xenophobia, uh, the traditionalism, parochialism. They also uh, are high in ethnocentrism. Ethnocentrism uh, is uh, uh, a preference for people like you, your in-group. You know, define your in-group. That starts with your, with, your, um, with your nuclear family, but then extends to the extended family and others with like values, like you. So that's your ethnocentric uh, component. And another component of uh, conservatism is uh, liking to just stay home. So philopatric, uh, uh, love of where you're born, you stay there your whole life and so forth. Under highly conservative, uh, in highly conservative cultures, you don't move much. So that's conservatism. And then the, the antipole of those values really characterizes uh, uh, individualism or liberalism. So instead of xenophobic, you're xenophilic. You like people that are different from you. You're comfortable with other kinds of people, even if they have different values, even if they have a different color, even if they believe differently. You're more comfortable with those than you are uh, if you're conservative. 
And uh, ethnocentric, uh, ethnocentrism is low under individualism and in, in, uh, more nuclear family oriented than extended family oriented. And uh, your, your, your in-group is really composed of people with all kinds of different beliefs and maybe colors and so forth, and backgrounds, as, as an individualist or, or liberal. And you're more prone to moving around. You know, frontier spirit, movement and adventure and going new places is, is a good idea. You got a passport uh, <laughs> if you're liberal. So those are, those are some, some big differences uh, between the two, you know, the two poles. And, and is uh, it, is it, how, how much is that, do you suppose, is it preference for familiarity versus preference for novelty? Is that yeah. at the core? No, that is at the, that's at the core. That's, that's part of the neophobia. You could, you could mm -hmm. put that under the neophobia. So the fear, avoidance, dislike of new, and that can be new ideas. It can be new types of folks. It can be new new discussions, all those kinds of things are avoided. And it's just, it's just, you know, most generally it characterizes outside. Okay. So, so let me ask you a really specific question about that, yeah. because you could think about that two ways. You could think about that as avoidance of the unfamiliar and dislike of the unfamiliar, or you could think about it as marked preference for the familiar. And then on the other side, you could think about it as marked preference for the novel, you know, rather than it being, is it against something or for something, or is it both on both sides? It's both. I mean, the, both. the, the against, the against can go all the way to hate, you know, under, mm -hmm. under high xenophobia, hate. And even, uh, you know, we get into how uh, uh, conservatism and uh, traditional societies and so forth promotes uh, intergroup aggression, warfare. So the point where you not only hate those outsiders, you want to kill them. Uh, and um, so you have both components that there, the, the out group, the avoidance, as well as the um, interest in, in, in socializing with people that are like you. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So yeah. now we've got the values dimensions nailed down. And so on to the parasite stress. Idea. Yeah. So, and when you start looking at conservatism, let's start there. The um, the connections to parasites jumped out at us, and let me try to explain. So, with xenophobia, okay, you want to avoid those people over there that are different from you, okay, and that's that's tied to a very fundamental part of uh, host parasite coevolution. So the way host parasite coevolution works is that uh, it's, it's ongoing and it's antagonistic and the parasite is trying to evolve to eat the host. The host is evolving defenses against the parasite and that continues uh, in forever. You, you never get out of your host parasite coevolutionary race. So you get this coevolutionary race between hosts and parasites, and uh, much and much, much research shows how localized those coevolutionary races are, geographically localized. So you get different strains of TB in different neighborhoods in a big city in Morocco, for example. Uh, it's geographically very, uh, very uh, uh, localized, these host parasite coevolutionary races, which means that locally you're relatively immune to the parasites, but the parasites on the outside and those people on the outside in the out groups, those parasites you're not uh, immune to. So that's why you have xenoph xenophobia. Uh, it is a way to avoid uh, foreign parasites that you're not uh, evolved to deal with immunologically. That's a xenophobia component. So that's contamination. It's avoidance of contamination. Right. And yeah, from, from parasites that you're not immune to, because you're relatively immune to the, mm -hmm. local, the local, and you're, sa you're safe with people that are just like you, okay, the local people, because they've got immunity like yours, and yours is relatively good against the local parasites but not the foreign parasites because of foreign parasites because of this uh, 
localization of the host uh, host uh, parasite coagulation at race. Right, and, and so you're saying that you don't have to go very far away before you get no, you don't have in to trouble. Go very far away, no. You, all these new strains of COVID popping up. Uh, there, you know, there are going to be lots and lots and lots of lots and lots of strains. And the um, you hear about some of the strains now. There are eight or ten or something like that. But they're they're uh, they're popping up and and uh, 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 you know there are more of them. They're, they're, the surveillance on this new strains is pretty limited so far. They haven't done a lot of that because they've been doing other things with the pandemic. But still, you get that you get that occurring with the COVID too. This localization of the strains. You know, there's a South African strain and so forth, so on, UK strain, and all that. So um, you don't have to go very far, okay, for the localization uh, of the immunity you have to not work so well. And that's where the filipatry comes in too. So filipatry, you just stay home. You stay home, you interact with people that are immunologically like you and therefore are safe, relatively safe, rather than dispersing to interact with foreigners and the habitats that may contain these, these parasites you're not adapted to. So that's the phil philopatric component. The ethnocentric component uh, is related to, so when the diseases come, uh, you want to have a lot of local social support. So you have all these ties with extended family and so forth. That's your social support. And in ethnographic societies, traditional societies, anthropologists have done a lot of research on how important it is to have kin that will help you when you get sick. That's the only way you can, you can make it. You have kin and kid and friends uh, locally that, that help you. That's, that's the ethnocentric part. Right. So, so yeah, if, there's a, if there's a high probability of illness uh, occurring, then you're more dependent in reality on your closest network, your and the higher you the, and the your higher, friends, yeah. your close friends. Exactly. The higher the parasite stress is in a region, the more likely it, those, those parasites are going to come eventually. And, and so you got to have that social support that's important uh, for dealing and getting through you and your family getting through the parasite uh, crunch. So that's why the ethnocentrism, philopatry, and uh, xenophobia components. And those have, you know, the component, another part, you know, subparts of that we talked about, openness to experience, new experiences uh, and all that that's part of, uh, part of really neophobia. Neophobia. Right. So we, okay. So there's a personality. So in, I got a couple of specific questions about that for you. So the best predictors of conservatism from a personality perspective are openness to experience, low, yeah. and one sub aspect or one aspect of conscientiousness, which is orderliness. Now, I noticed in your research, you looked at extroversion and openness together. Yeah. And yeah. you, you saw that the more collectivist slash conservative types who are protecting themselves, according to parasite stress theory from contamination, are likely to be more introverted and lower in openness. And that means less exploratory in general, it, it, because Indeed. those two things together seem to maybe make up exploratory behavior. But there is good personality data showing that the orderly part of conscientiousness is also a predictor of conservatism. And yeah. that... I don't know if I don't know if there's been any data because that's a micro, more micro analysis in yeah, relationship to conscientiousness. Looked, nobody's looked at that component, but absolutely, orderliness is very fundamental to conservatism. You want order. Disorder is chaos from the standpoint of a conservative mind. You know, you want order in everything. Yeah, and chaos is. See, I've thought, and this is interesting too, because maybe we could talk a little bit about the the emotions that are elicited here. So, for the longest time, I was I had been thinking about the conservative collectivist viewpoint in re, in relationship to novelty in two two element two yeah. manners. One is that the more conservative mind doesn't get as much of a positive emotional kick out of novelty and exploration. Right. Because that, that's fundamentally motivating if you have the personality type that's associated with exploratory behavior. But then there's this idea of phobia too, like neophobia. But you know, conservatives aren't higher in neuroticism. And so, and that, and that's really a striking finding because if anything, it turns out that 
at least under some conditions, liberals seem to be higher in trait neuroticism. Yeah. But there's a role of disgust that seems to be under examined. And is it is it is the neophobia a consequence of fear or is it a consequence of disgust, which seems more tightly associated with immunity as opposed to say fear? Yeah. Well you I mean, you know, you can you can get prejudice toward an outgroup that has fear components and disgust components. I mean, you can be absolutely disgusted, you know, how the conservative person who uh, has to interact with an outgroup will might even have the disgust face, how to disgust it, but it's also- I, mean, I think you see that fear. with food, for example. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. You get it with food or, uh, you know, any, any kind of pathogen threat can evoke disgust just an emotion of disgust uh, in, uh, you know, in a person. And the more conservative they are, the more likely to get the actual disgust reaction. Yeah, well, in disgust, kind of you know, I moral, read... Moral violation, food, rotten food, dirty toilet, all that stuff, yeah. So that, that some account, like people have struggled for a long time to make sense of dietary prohibitions in religious contexts, for example. And, and I mean... If, if you have dietary restrictions and markers for in-group uh, identification, that's a good way of deciding or of determining consistently who's on your side and also marking who's on the other side. Yeah. All so, kinds of things come into play to indicate boundary between in-group and out -group. Well, okay. Boundary. So when I was looking at thinking about the relationship, you know, there's, there's five basic personality dimensions and 10 aspects. And so, but only two of them really, really strongly predict political affiliation and that's openness. Yeah. So right. high openness is liberalism and, and, and uh, orderliness, which is less powerful predictor. But so the conservatives are low in openness and high in orderliness. And I thought, why in the world do those two uncorrelated personality predictors co-vary to predict political belief? And then I thought, over a number of years that it has to be, it has to do with borders is the yeah. fundamental political question is the conservative likes thick borders between everything. And yeah. the liberal wants thin borders and the liberal wants thin borders because their niche is the locale where information is transferred. And, but the co the, 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 the counter tendency is the conservative tendency to say, yeah, but if you're where the information is going to be transferred because the borders are thin, you're probably going to get sick and die. And they're both right. Yeah. Seem reasonable? Yeah, Isn't right reasonable? in terms of what is Well, sometimes the there. conservatives are right that you're going to die if you get yeah. if you expose oh, yeah. yourself to what's new right. and sometimes the liberals are right in that you need what's new to renew you. Right. Well, these these values that we acquire are very strategic and they're uh, you know, they're they're suitable for our understanding of the culture that we live in. They're suitable for that. They're optimal for that. So if you grow up, we haven't really talked about the evidence yet behind the parasite stress theory debate. And that'll get that your comments get, get me into that. Um, so we looked at we looked at um, the theory in relation to um, what it predicts to test it. So it predicts that the, you know, if you take measures of parasite stress across the world, uh, countries or states of the United States or whatever, that that will correspond to conservative or collectivist values measured by uh, measured by political scientists. These measures and put in the literature for countries and states, measures of by psychologists of individualism, collectivism put into the literature. So we pull those data and look for the predictive relationship between parasite stress and uh, conservatism and liberalism and found uh, what we expected and strongly so. The more parasites, the more conservative. Said differently, the more parasites, the more collectivists. And so does that broadly mean the more infectious diseases? Yes, and so the, yeah, more, there's two, two ways basically uh, we've measured, or several ways now, we've measured infectious disease levels. So by parasite, I mean any infectious agent. It doesn't mean just intestinal worms or something. It's any infectious agent. So virus, bacterium, worms, whatever level of parasites you're talking about is a parasite. Um, 
infectious disease, synonymous with infectious disease. So uh, you can take number of infectious diseases per country, for example. You can take number of infectious diseases per state for the U.S. Uh, or you can take the rate of infection, so the, the pro proportion of the population that has uh, each of these infectious diseases in an area. So it, either number of infectious diseases or the prevalence of the infectious diseases. And either of those uh, very strongly and, and similarly predicts uh, the values with more infectious diseases, more conservatism, uh, that is more collectivism, the fewer infectious diseases, the more liberalism. That's done on just the geographic level. But then, and we did all that initially. And then, um, and then others came along quickly, actually, <laughs> once it got started. And it's still, it's still um, really blooming out there, all the research on the parasite stress theory values done by people all over the world now. But uh, st people started doing it at the individual level. So you take a per bring a person into the lab and you show them cues of uh, immediate parasite danger. So these are just like a slideshow with... Uh, with uh, disease cues in it. So a dirty mm -hmm. toilet, a person with skin pox, a uh, person sneezing, uh, those, kinds of, those kinds of cues. So they see these slides and then you measure their values before and after seeing the slides. And uh, you have an immediate effect, amazing, immediate effect. You can so let me talk about the power of these, of, of these relationships. So if I remember correctly, some of the data that your team generated showed that the correlation between infectious disease prevalence, so parasite stress, and conservatism was as high as 0.7. Yeah. So staggering, un unprecedented yeah. strength. Yeah, that's, that's stronger than the relationship between general cognitive ability, or it's as strong as the relationship between general cognitive ability and learning, which is the strongest association um, I've ever seen in social sciences. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We get some big effect sizes. I mean, there's very, there vary in terms of what particular prediction we're looking at. And we've looked across so many domains of um, human life that, you know, there's variation in effect size. But, but yeah, it's, some of these effects are tremendous. And of course, we, uh, we do, you know, through standard statistical procedure, uh, we do controls too of potential confounders in all these analyses. So that's that's at the you know you can do the regional stuff with countries of the world, um, states of the United States in relation to values and parasite level. But then this stuff coming along with looking at individuals um, really is 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 nice too because you got the you got the same patterns in the regional Causally. level. Yeah, and the individual level. Right, so we should take that apart a little bit. So the problem with comparing nations is there's lots of differences between nations that might be correlated with parasites. Correct. So it's, but then if you go to the state by state level within a country, you, you, you control for lots of those variations. You have, you have. And uh, also in your analysis itself, you do, uh, you do statistical controls of things that potentially could be problematic confounds, whether you're looking at between countries or between states. Um, so we, 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 uh, we have data from all, all those levels. The, some of the more recent stuff, it's coming out now. People are doing, uh, they did a lot with the slideshow that I mentioned. There were 10 slides that reliably will evoke uh, greater conservatism. But then now they're looking at um, um, showing people uh, uh, like a short story about COVID, uh, COVID's real serious in your neighborhood or something like that, you know, and that does it too. <laughs> so do you think there'll be a swing towards conservative political belief in, across the world because of the, because of this pandemic? Will that yeah. shape the political beliefs of, of a and is there, a, is there a crucial period for that to be shaped? So, for example, will this have a bigger effect on, say, 14 to 16-year-olds or 16 to 18-year-olds who are catalyzing their identity? Would, you, would, would there be a cohort that's that a, would be most that's effective? A, that's a really interesting point, and I've thought a lot about it. We don't, there's, no, there's, no, there's no data on that now. So, if you, I mean, the way that you could empirically 
uh, attack such a thing would be to look at um, to look at people of different ages in yeah. relation to like the effect of these experiments on them. Do you get a bigger effect size when you when you show slides the disease slides to one age group versus another? Yeah, or would it last longer? Major, That'd yeah, be the other issue, right? We there. don't know how long it lasts either. That research, surprisingly, has not been done. You bring people into the lab, and uh, you show them these slides, and you get the effect. Also, one, one nuance of that is if you measure the what we call the perceived vulnerability to disease, that's a 14-item that's a, a questionnaire that's validated and measures a person's uh, concern about infectious disease. And that's an individually variable thing. More conservative people are, the higher their score on that, of course, and worry about infectious disease. So people that are high on this uh, going into the experiment show a bigger effect when they see the slides. They shift more in terms of degree of conservatism. Do you, do you know if there's any effects of personality on that? So if that hadn't been looked at, it hasn't either. been done yet. But it would, there would be uh, some covariance there because the people that are high and worry about infectious disease are basically conservative people. So they're going to have less openness to, you know, uh, new things and more introversion and all that kind of stuff. Uh, right. already. Yeah. So when I first came across your parasite stress hypothesis, I was reading a fair bit of the literature on disgust generated a fair bit of it by Jonathan Haidt and his research yeah. team, because he was one of the first psychologists to look at disgust as an independent emotion. And, but I was reading a book called Hitler's Table Talk, which was yeah. a collection of his spontaneous utterances at mealtimes collected over about three years. And it, it really affected my reading of it because the number of times that he referred that he used parasite metaphors really stuck in my mind. Yeah. And I started to look at all of the Nazi propaganda from before the Second World War in terms of parasite stress hypothesis, especially after I also realized that Hitler, Hitler's extermination campaign arguably had its origins in public health policy because they started out with well, tuberculosis interventions and then they went to clean up the mental hospitals and so on. And like the... the you know, and Hitler went on a factory cleanup binge, essentially, after coming to power. And they used a variant of Zyklon gas as an insecticide in the factory cleanups. So this wow. was all quite terrifying, reading yeah. what you were writing and reading this yeah. at the same time. And I don't know what you, I mean, I'm going to ask you to comment about that, what you think about yeah. that. But yeah, yeah. his metaphor for parasites, that's that's a fundamental metaphor. The, the Germans, the Nazis, right, seem to right. view themselves as under assault by parasites. The, the Mussolini was the same way. So you said Mussolini was the same way. Exactly the same way. He was a he was just a replicate of, or Hitler a replicate of him. Um, Mussolini was, you know, his fascist uh, dictator of uh, Italy when Italy was fascist, and uh, Hitler fascist uh, leader of uh, Nazi. Fascism. But uh, Mussolini, he, he, for example, outlawed uh, handshaking in Italy. Uh -huh. He thought it was the most disgusting thing to touch a person's hand. He was as much germaphobe as, as Hitler. And, and Hitler stuff, bathed four times a day. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's still going on in some parts of the world. And these 30 minute showers in the Middle East, people talk about, <laughs> where you get the highly conservative people that uh, really clean up. Um, but um, with regard to fascism, I've been very interested in fascism, of course, because it's over there on the on the extreme pole of conservative end of things. You know, all, it's got all the components of conservatism in writ large, and um, so I've been interested in the origin of fascism in in uh, in Germany and in, uh, in Italy and Japan about the same time. The three. The three big fascisms have been some other fascisms too. But a recent study, you'll be interested to know, has looked at infectious disease in uh, German regions, cities, in relation to uh, voting 
for Nazi, for, for, for Hitler's party, Nationalist uh, Socialist Party. And uh, the more, uh, the more, the way it works is, so he, he had, he has data from uh, 1918 to 1920, the number of Spanish flu cases in all oh, these Germans. I never Germany. thought about Sp Spanish flu as a contributor because that yeah. came right after World War I, of course. And yeah, right after World it War It was I. one of the things that devastated, an already devastated Germany. It, yeah, in Derm yeah, in the world in general. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Germany was really hit hard by, uh, by the Spanish flu, as Italy was, uh, too. And... Um, and what this guy did, he got data. There's a there's a uh, data collection managed by the University of Michigan on the third uh, data from Third Reich and before the Third Reich became officially a Third Reich in Germany. And these data include the number of cases of death due to um, Spanish flu in all these German cities. Also, they got number of deaths from um, from plague and tuberculosis and so forth, uh, too. Tuberculosis was was still a big problem by that point too. It wasn't just right. wasn't just Spanish flu, but it, Spanish flu was the main killer. But tuberculosis probably number two. Plague wasn't a big deal by that point. So these data these data uh, have number of votes. Uh, in these different cities for the uh, Nazi party. They had the number of votes for the Communist Party and number of votes for various things. So the, the, the Communist Party was considered extremist then, as was the Nazi Party. Um, and uh, the votes are from, uh, let's see, the years 1930 to 1933, I think. So the critical years uh, for the rise of uh, for really Nazism to get big there. And uh, the, more, the more people dying from the Spanish flu in 1918 to 1920 in a city, the greater the vote for the Nazi party in 1930 to 33. So, uh, so that's a connection that's, that was of interest to me. And this paper is just, uh, it's recently appeared. Any idea about the size of the relationship? And, and what about economic, uh, are there, are there confounds of economic well-being in the cities? Very important. He controlled, he was able to control through the same data set for uh, employment in those cities mm -hmm. and for average wages in those cities, two variables. Related to related to economic state. Well, I mean that that's the traditional thing. Historians will tell you, well, the Germans were so uh, economically distraught that they bought this stuff, you know. But uh, the parasite stress theory values adds a new uh, new new mirror here, I think, for uh, for fascism. And Italy, I've searched and searched for data on um, on. Uh, flu death uh, in Italy, um, but I don't think there's going to be anything like it. For some reason, a Third Reich is, you know, collected lots and lots of data, and um, they, somehow University of Michigan, I don't know the history of, of the acquisition by the University of Michigan of these data, but it is a, uh, it is a, a reliable data source that is used now in sociological and research. Now you studied other elements of parasite stress theory too. Its relationship with altruism, its relationship with human cognitive abilities. Yeah, yeah. So um, yeah, we did uh, we did study of um, IQ in relation to parasite stress and um, across the world and across the states in the U.S. and that uh, worked out very well. The the thinking was was simply that if you've got um, you know, you think about the human immune system, it is tremendous. It's everywhere in the body. And it's a very, very costly uh, system in terms of energy and in terms of uh, tissue to, uh, to make and maintain this immune system. Humans have this huge brain too, very sophisticated nervous system. 
that is very costly. So we assumed that these two components of the body, immune system and, and nervous system, would trade off. And so under, under high infectious disease, you got to make a good immune system or you're going to die. But that's going to cost you in terms of uh, uh, neural development and so forth. So we predicted that more infectious disease, lower IQ. Predicted it for across uh, regions of the, of the world, uh, countries and, and states. And so we went to the IQ literature, which is massive. That's a big topic in psychology, as you know, study of IQ. And uh, there were data for essentially all the countries of the world. And there were data for the states. Uh, and we pulled those and looked at the predictions. And uh, the predictions were met for both cross, uh, cross national uh, predictions, about 0.8 between parasite stress and uh, IQ. More parasites, lower IQ, about 0.8. For the US, it's about 0.7 US states. 50. Within states? Yeah. Between the fifty states, you take you take average well, IQ. Okay, so so let's let's pull back just a bit for everybody. Yeah. I mean, it's it's important for everyone who's listening to realize just how important a role infectious disease actually plays in the shaping of human evolution, cultural evolution included. So, for example, there are estimates. Correct me if I'm wrong, Doctor Thornhill, but there are estimates that ninety to ninety five percent of the native inhabitants of North and South America died as a consequence of contact with Europeans because of the transmission of measles, smallpox, and mumps primarily, although they were also prone to many other diseases that were brought in by the Europeans who had lived in tight packed cities, often with animals as close companions, had 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 uh, what would you say? exposure to a wide variety of extremely toxic diseases, developed immunity, but then brought those diseases to the new world and basically decimated the entire population. Right. So this That's is a non-trivial event by, yeah. by, any, by any standard. The Europeans, by the time they started moving out of Europe into the new world, uh, the Europeans, uh, I mean, they had all their diseases, but they were, had relative immunity to lots of respiratory diseases, turns out. And uh, so they brought all that stuff over here and killed most of the native uh, New World people. <laughs> yeah, agree. most. Of I, them. I had read that when the when the Pilgrims hit Plymouth, the natives were desperate to see them because they had lost so many people they couldn't harvest their crops. Yeah. Yeah, it was uh, it was a mess and continued to be a mess a long time. Yeah. Right. So, so when, when isolated populations of human beings have come into contact in the past, the upside is the trading of cultural resources, essentially. And that can be a tremendous upside. But the downside is the exchange right. of infectious diseases. That's right. And we're caught yeah. between those two catastrophes, well, those two, an opportunity and a catastrophe, which present themselves simultaneously. Yeah. Yes. Openness and uh, just liberalism uh, is, is great. Uh, in terms of its benefits. You got interaction with lots of different kinds of people. You get a bigger social network, you got a bigger mating pool. Uh, you know, you don't care if, if they're different from you, you want to interact with them. And you can uh, innovate out of catastrophe. Yeah, new ideas, new ideas, innovations you, coming from the outside that you can use locally. Uh, but that'll only work under low infectious disease because we get high infectious disease, all that uh, outgroup contact uh, interaction will kill you. Yeah. Yeah. And well, that's that's exactly what we've seen in the last two year and a half, too. Yes, absolutely. So we're right all... in the middle of it. We're right in the middle of it. And the mortality, you know, the the morta human mortality from infectious disease before the pandemic. Uh, was still greater than any other measured source. So there's a uh, recent work that's looked at, well, you, you can just sort of summarize it this way. You can look at, you can look at, at genes that are, that have, uh, that play known roles in human life. So there are genes associated with immunity and those have been described by immunologists, which, which genes are involved. There are genes involved in diet, the genes involved in digesting uh, protein and all that kind of stuff. All these you know, gene uh, functions are known. 
if you then you you look at where in the human genome there's the most turnover of new alleles, new genes. Those are genes that are evolutionarily very active. It turns out that the immunity genes are the evolutionary hotspots in the human genome. Hmm. And that says there's more mortality from infectious disease than from other measured uh, problems that humans face. Most mortality still is from infectious disease. That was done at uh, 50 sites, human sites uh, throughout. So that, that provides evidence that that's actually the worst threat facing the worst threat constantly. Still, yeah. Hence its powerful effect on such things as values. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. It's the main mortality factor. And if you look at the anthropological evidence about the importance of infectious disease versus other things, um, there's a lot of evidence for that. A, a nice review recently that some people did. Um, but infectious disease is the main killer of infants and older children um, in the ethnographic records of you know traditional societies. Uh, infectious disease is the big one. Next is infanticide. That's number two, where parents kill their kids uh, strategically because they can't raise them under resource limitation or, or the kids are sick or whatever. Infanticide is very common. That's number two. But infectious disease is the main killer. So, okay, so here's some radical ideas, I suppose, because I mean, reading all this, learning this, Okay, let, let, before we go there, let's do one other thing. Main objections to the theory, practical and, and, and empirical. What's, what, I read a paper recently, and I, I'm, I'm afraid I can't cite it in detail, but it'll serve as an example, claiming that with proper control for technological development, the causal or the effect of parasite stress on political belief vanished. Now you cite many, many papers in your books and in your papers. So I'm by no means saying that this is yeah. a canonical study, but it's very used. This is a very, 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 very provocative theory. I mean, it upends in some sense, my sense when I first encountered it was that it upends almost everything we think about politically. And so it, and, and what, what's the saying that, that extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. We've got to look at the counter evidence too. So what do you think are the main weaknesses of the idea as far as you're concerned and how have you addressed them and have they been successfully addressed? Yeah, uh, we, we had, we had, we've addressed them as they have come out and the parasite stress theory of, of values has gotten, uh, when it first came out, it got so much attention that that attracted a lot of people to try to falsify it, you know? And that's the way that works in science. Yeah, thank and God. So we went through that. We went through that phase, and now uh, all the research is uh, looking at very interesting spinoffs in productive ways of the parasite stress theory. And um, no criticisms have come out recently. But the kind of thing you're talking about, where you know it's really a modernity, modern things, and so forth. Right. That controls our bad. That's a, that's an old idea in uh, in the literature that um, you know basically people just get more modern, they get more liberal, and uh, so forth. And and we take that on in a number of ways. And the one way I'd like to uh, you might be interested in we look at the uh, the cultural uh, and social revolution of the '60s and '70s in the West. So what happened? Mm -hmm. uh, and I was there. <laughs> uh, you had uh, you had a uh, liberalization of values, basically, is the bottom line. But um, you had more, uh, uh, you know, uh, more. Um, you know, the women's movement started then. Uh, there was a sexual revolution, same time. Right, uh, which AIDS put the put a terrible crimp in another infectious agent. Yeah, and. Uh, and uh, uh, ethnic groups, that uh, minority groups that had been ostracized and so forth got more attention, positive attention. There was democratization of, of law, voter, voter laws and all that changed. So you can, and it, was, it was more than just people talk about that time as the sexual revolution time, the 60s and 70s, but really it was a, it was a much broader social revolution. 
involving human rights, uh, an increase in human rights and liberties, basically liberalization. So what the hell happened? Well, here's what happened. It was infectious disease changes that began in the 20s that led to all these liberals in the West uh, in the 60s and 70s. And these infectious disease changes are well So the control of infectious diseases like malaria? Yeah. Yeah, well, yeah, bigger than that. It started out in 1920 with uh, chlorinated water. That started in the West. Mm -hmm. We're talking about the West. The, the rest of the world didn't change. They didn't go through the social revolution. Mo many places in the world still haven't because of disease levels are high. And all of Africa, basically, much of Asia. Um, but 1920s, chlorinated water started in the West and quickly spread throughout uh, the Western world. By the Western world, I mean US, Canada, uh, Western Europe, Australia, New Zealand, those places. Um, so, so chlorinated water, and that knocked out lots and lots of infectious disease, put a little chlorine in public water. Also in the 20s began uh, some systematic garbage collection before people just threw the garbage out in their alley. Sewage treatment plants started then too, to, and there was more indoor plumbing in the, starting in the 20s. Now let's jump to the 40s. 40s, big, big changes with regard to emancipation from parasites. Had uh, child vaccination programs that began in the 40s. Also antibiotics, first good antibiotics right after World War II, 1945 in the 40s. So th this was really by that point a new world in terms of lowered infectious disease compared to the world that all generations of humans had experienced in the West prior to those 20s and 40s. There were some antibiotics in the 30s, but sulfur drugs and so forth, but they had terrible side effects. So the real good antibiotics didn't come along until the 40s and broad spectrum kind of antibiotics. And of course, that spread so rapidly that <laughs> the use of antibiotics that uh, they quickly saw resistance to antibiotics popping up, you know, the evolution of resistance and mm -hmm, mm -hmm. parasites. Um, yes, which is a serious problem we have now because we have diseases that are resistant to almost all the broad spectrum absolutely. antibiotics, even in combination. That's, That's a looming catastrophe, which we should That's obviously pay attention to. Right. Arms race between the parasites and the drug companies now with that. With that. Uh, so up to the 40s, and then also in the 40s, uh, you had um, insecticides coming along, good insecticides, chlorinated hydrocarbons and organophosphate insecticides that killed uh, pest species, including mosquitoes. So uh, ve vectors, uh, important vectors of uh, disease in the, in the, in the, uh, in the West, mosquitoes, uh, so they knocked out malaria, knocked out yellow fever with that. And, um, and uh, so all that was going on to emancipate people. And then a generation two or two later, you get the rise of liberalism throughout the West. So all these liberal young people growing up in a relatively disease-free environment by all these, by all these health interventions, uh, became the hippies and sure, so forth. they were healthy enough to be yeah. free yeah and so that does really raise the question again yeah. of what covid this, this covid pandemic and the lockdown is going to do to the political temperament of the west or the world for that matter but right it's a particular change in the west because we're not accustomed to this sort of thing anymore right so it's, it's so interesting yeah. because of course i've thought of the the liberalism revolution being a secondary derivative of the birth control pill which is a biological revolution of immense magnitude, but I hadn't ever considered in depth, yeah. even after Very reading part work, of it. Uh, I mean, the use of birth control and all that by women, that's, that, that takes some willingness to try new things. Right, exactly. Well, that's <laughs> it. That might be dependent itself thing. on... That's yes. way away from tradition. Uh, you know, taking birth control. So to, there's another perverse implication of the theory that you've developed too, which is that conservatism insistence upon hygiene and disease prevention is a precondition for liberalism yeah. if it's successful right so it's in some sense the conservatives are battling off the disease 
so that people can stay healthy. But the consequence of that is as soon as that they're healthy, they become liberal. Yeah. Yeah. That, God, isn't that, that something? Conserv- eh? Yeah. Well, I think it's, here's, you, you can look at it like this. So if, if you've got high conservatism in a place, then those conservatives are doing things that promote, uh, well, they're, you know, they're not, they're not, uh, they're not using modern technology. They're not, you know, open to new ideas. They're not open to science and all that. So those right. are, so, those are mm-hmm. attitudes that help the infectious disease, really. Right, 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 right. So their yeah. reliance on traditional. That's right. Traditionalism is also an impediment, a tr- tremendous it, impediment. Yeah, it, it, mm-hmm. it reduces their contact immediately. So it works against them that way. I mean, if right. you're not, you know, pro-science and uh, open to new ideas and innovations and all that kind of stuff, that has tremendous limitations. And uh, so, you know, you don't even put in septic tanks and you think, or chlorinate the water. Or, or, you okay, know, so, so you another vaccination. You don't get a vaccination. Yeah. Right. Well, okay, so let's talk about two things then. One is I've been struck, and tell me what you think about this, the COVID has become a politicized issue in Canada and in the US, but it doesn't seem to have happened the way you might have predicted if you were relying on parasite stress theory, mm. because it seems yeah. to be that the conservative types are the ones who are objecting most strenuously to the lockdowns and to the inoculations, whereas the liberal types, I mean, and maybe I'm wrong about this, but yeah. seem to be more uh, in favor of the of restrictions of movement and so on, and that that actually I don't I can't get my head around that exactly. Yeah. No, you're right. That is the pattern, and that's been studied now. And uh, you know there there's some papers on it. Um, mm-hmm. And here's the way. Here's what's going on. I think in the U.S. in particular, uh, the the conservative government at the time when COVID was getting off the ground, the Trump administration uh, was very negative about COVID. I mean, he called it a hoax and all that didn't believe it and uh, no problem. And um, so that is the authority. We need to talk about authoritarianism because this is where it comes in. You have the king, Donald Trump, saying that it's no problem. This disease is no problem. And it's just going to go away. It's a hoax and all that kind of stuff. And that that is the word from God, basically, to highly liberal, highly uh, conservative people. And that's the way authoritarianism works. People that are highly authoritarian, and that's conservatives, that's strong, there's a lot of evidence there. Authoritarianism is, is very highly uh, correlated with uh, conservatism, in fact, a component of it. The more the more authoritarian the people are, the more likely they will follow these guys that they that they label as their leader, and to the point that they'll follow them anywhere. They'll follow them off a cliff, basically, as they did in in Germany, as they did in Italy, and as they did in the United States during this COVID thing. So you believe that what happened was that the evidence that there was in fact a dangerous epidemic was rendered non-credible. And so the right. conservative tendency to prevent the disease didn't kick in. That's right, exactly. So and do you think what, that's a good enough- What prevented it was the authoritarianism that our conservatives are carrying. And had Trump acted another way, you know, said this disease is really important. I want you folks to wear a mask and, uh, be careful and distance and all that kind of stuff, uh, then there would have been a different outcome because that would have been the authority message. So yeah. it's one it's one element of, of authoritarianism slash conservatism interfering with another. That's right. Uh, okay. Um, parasite stress and sex. Yeah. <laughs> There's been some... Uh, some look at uh, values in relation to sex. So conservatism, conservatives are conservative. <laughs> so there's, there's old studies that uh, 
there's a there's one paper I should send you. It's you got all kinds of correlations in there with everything under the sun in relation to conservatism and uh, liberalism. But uh, you know, interest in uh, uh, interest in um, uh, different you know different positions, copulatory positions, and all that. You didn't, the conservatives more likely to just stick to the missionary style, and whereas the liberals are uh, more uh, adventurous with regard, <laughs> regard to positions. And, and, is, and is there a relationship that between adventurousness in sexual position and the risk of transmitting sexually transmitted diseases? Don't know. I, don't, I haven't seen anything on that particular uh, thing. But, you know, liberals are more, more interested in... in uh, be more interested in um, partners that are in different uh, ethnic groups. I mean, that's been studied. You don't limit your your sexual interests just to your in group. If you're liberal, you're happy with people of different color and different uh, backgrounds and all that kind of stuff as as sex partners. So so those kinds of things have been done uh, with regard to sexual behavior. Um, we did a we did we did the variable. Um, social sexual orientation. It's a, it's a variable, it's validated um, in, in psychology and it's, it measures really a person's attitude about uh, promiscuity or, or sex without commitment, you call it sex without commitment. And that varies among individuals, uh, their attitude about sex uh, uh, without commitment. And we looked and there data on, uh, I think it was uh, 120 countries uh, measures. So we took those data and looked at them in relation to uh, parasite stress and values. And um, the, more, the more parasites, the, uh, the less, uh, uh, less interest that women show in non-committal sex. So the more parasites. And that's yeah. pro that's mediated, I presume, by a cultural response to the presence of the parasites. Yeah, rather... right. That's conservatism. Oh. Yeah. And I will uh, have have any studies been done huh, that are analogous to the the political studies where where people are shown images that are reminiscent of of parasitic presence, and then asked about their sexual preferences with regards to monogamy or uncommitted relationships. No, that hadn't been done. No. That hadn't been done. Well, uh, there's a PhD thesis for someone. In, yeah, we just did the. We just took the SOI data, social uh, sexual orientation inventory data, for men and women across these countries, and looked at it in relation to parasite stress and and values. And uh, as I mentioned, it as as uh, infectious disease increases, women show more restriction. As and it's women, women specifically. Women specifically, the effect for men is not reliable. This is not very big and probably not even reliable, statistically significant. But for women, it's highly significant. The more parasites, the more restricted women are. And that goes along with conservatism. So conservatism, there's a sexual purity and um, protect the jewels kind of attitude that is instilled by uh, conservative culture in women. So, but in, in women, in well, so the, yeah. there's a question. Yeah, so, it's okay. So, you know, it's a double so, standard. Yeah. Well, when you get parasite stress increasing, then is the conservative proclivity manifested to begin with in the women and then spread to the men? I mean, because they're more primarily concerned, let's say, with sexual contamination. I yeah. mean, the role of the genders in determining. But the, the men are the men are changing. The men are changing in other components. Uh, so they're, the men are hot to trot, regardless of. Well, their, that's what I was yeah. thinking. Yeah, but the but the men are the men are changing in terms of uh, becoming more xenophilic and uh, ethnocentric and those kinds of things. Mm. You know, yeah. Those, so those the sexual are, changes don't drive the rest of it. No. Uh -uh. Mm, okay, because I mean, changes in sexual behavior often drive changes in other phenomena. It can be so. important. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. You also wrote, write about parasite stress and religiosity. Yeah, we did uh, a big study of that, looking at religion scholars, uh, looking at their data on uh, commitment and participation of people in religion across um, basically all the countries of the world. 
and we had state data too. We had U.S. state data and, uh, on participation and uh, commitment of people, and um, predicting that more parasites, more religiosity, measured either as commitment or participation, and uh, more conservatism, of course, more religiosity. That's well known already. More conservative uh, people uh, are more. And then those would be traditional markers of religiosity, like church attend, such as church attendance, yeah, say, they, rather they than spirituality per number se. Number of times a month you go to church, uh, and stated commitment that you have. Do you believe? Uh, do you believe in the local religion? That kind of thing. Uh, this religion scholars, you know, have done that, done a good job, and then published all that in the literature. So you pull their data, and then look at it in relation to. Uh, Parasite stress, the more parasites, the more religious people are. And we expected it from the following uh, uh, ideas that it was known that religiosity is very tightly correlated with conservatism before. That had been shown by lots of folks in the past. But religiosity has, uh, has a, uh, some couple of parts to it that were of interest to us from the standpoint of the parasite stress theory. One is the uh, boundary issue that religions often show. So in fact, relig religion scholars uh, define religions in terms of boundary. So this group over here believes in this God, the group over here believes in this God or gods, and so forth. And so those are boundary it. markers. Those boundary beliefs. marker, yes. And so the boundary would, would be like a xenophobic kind of function, you know, to, to bound, to bound, to in group, out group kind of separation. The other part of religiosity that was of interest uh, from the standpoint of the parasite stress theory is the ethnocentric part. So you get that in-group binding with your, with your colleagues at church and so forth that can be extremely strong. And uh, so there, there we looked at it and, and found that uh, basically a new, new theory of religion, that more parasites, more religiosity across countries of the world. And, and states of uh, and what sort of effect you, size is that? Uh, those uh, I don't remember offhand. Uh, big effects. Uh, I mean, it was we published in the major uh, brain and behavioral sciences, uh, major, you know, uh, top top tier journal. Uh, but again, you could you know back to your earlier question about showing people these immediate parasite threats. The slides are some other way that they're manipulating that now. They're doing all kinds of things with that um, and see if people get believe in God more or something like that mm -hmm. immediately. That would be cool. Yes. <laughs> yes, it would be. And you change and it, a person's a, belief in, in spirits by, uh, by that. Uh, well, be you good. also wonder cool. too if, you know, I'm just thinking here, ideas are just flashing through my mind about beliefs in spirit to begin with, because the belief in spirit causing illness, for example, is sort of a, an early analog of a disease theory. Yeah, you know, oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, I mean, people and, are often- uh, Yeah, there's a study, uh, uh, I can't remember exactly what it is, I've got it on my pile over here, uh, that claims that the fundamental belief we have in a spiritual world really boils down to spirits as diseases. Mm -hmm. As disease-causing entities. Disease well, they are invisible agents that are yeah, transmissible invisible after and, all. But, you, but you, you can transmit them too. Yes. With the evil eye and all this other uh, stuff in cultures that... Um, suggest transmission of uh, of this of this spirit and of course before the germ theory uh before germs were known parasites were known to cause disease it was all invisible so spirits feel that and um witches you know as as witches as uh channels for the evil that these spirits have. That's part of it too. And the inquisition and so forth and so on. All that's real cool stuff. And everything that's unknown, yeah, right? right? Because they, well, that- and well, it's it, down it, to it, a disease. Yeah. Right, right, right. And they were well, right. The disease was killing everybody, most of the people anyway, you know? So, um, yeah. Well, you know, 
that was all actually too interesting. I guess I'd like to close with this. So you've been studying this a long time and yeah. it's very, huh, unexpected. It's a very unexpected theory, I would say. What, how has knowing this, how has studying this changed the way you look at society and people and political dialogue? I mean, you're in this position, I've only been di digesting the material you've been producing for about five years, I would say, maybe maybe 10. Yeah. And it, it hasn't permeated my thought system entirely, but you've been wrestling this with this for three decades, two decades anyways. So Actually, in a, in a sense, all my life. Let me explain. I, I was born and raised in, uh, in the Old South, heart of Dixie, Alabama. So I was born into a culture that hadn't really changed in 100 years, except they had cars and stuff. But ideologically, there would been no change since the Civil War. Very conservative place. And um, for reasons I... I I may, you know, I think about a lot, how, how come I came out of it liberal rather than uh, conservative. Um, um, I, you know, would say, you know, I would find what these people were doing day in, day out. It's in your face all the time if you live in a conservative culture, uh, the inhumanity. And, um, and, you know, why are they doing that? And what's wrong with you people? That kind of thing. And then finally, hell, I just decided uh, I was going to step back and uh, just try to think about it, study it. And I finally got around to that uh, in my scientific research. And most of my research was on sexual selection processes and so forth. And I only got into the value stuff about the uh, year 2000. And, um, and um, so it, I've had this... in. The very, very strong interest in how these people I grew up with got to be that way. Then when I went off to university, uh, I went into a relatively liberal place. So I was then I became interested in how these people, how these liberals got their, got their mindset too. I was more like them. And um, so I'm, I go back a long way in my interest in this. And the, you know, it, it's just, it's been really satisfying to, to understand the cause, you know, to be, do the science on it and really understand the causal stuff and stuff that happened uh, in my family and so forth. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to do a popular book for the intelligent reader on all this. But uh, it was one incident where in, in, in the old South, uh, middle class and upper class families, white families, would hire uh, um, a black woman to raise the kids or black women to raise the kids. And my family did that. And I was closer to this woman really in many ways than I was my birth mother. And she died when I was 13. My black mama died and um, she got sick. And my family wouldn't let me go see her when she was sick because uh, she was sick and they were conservative and they were worried about me. I mean, they were trying to protect me, but I didn't understand that at the time. And in my mind, she was my mother. She, she raised me. She was with me every day. Uh, and uh, from the time I was born until she died when she was 13. But I couldn't go see her. They finally let me go to her house. She lived in a little shack, wooden shack on the other side of the tracks, so to speak. And because uh, it was regional segregation, everything was segregated. And uh, so I got, they let me stand on the porch and talk to her. She was inside in the bed dying. But I could talk to her on the porch. And we talked. And she died uh, five days after that. And they didn't even, my family wouldn't even allow, didn't even tell me where they, she was buried and so forth. I mean, there was that level of uh, conservatism and worry about disease. And I'd go to her grave or something and catch a disease. Mm. But what this knowledge of values has helped me with is things like that. Events, and there are lots of them in my upbringing that were devastating uh, 
because of the con, you know conservative values that I was dealing with, terrible things happening. And um, so I think that's one thing that really has sparked my, my interest in values. And then of course I'm liberal now, how did I get that way? I mean, my high school, it was a high school, uh, Decatur, Alabama is where I grew up, my high school graduating class of about 200. And there were about three liberals in the class. <laughs> I was one, and uh, um, one of my close friends, he was liberal. He's, he's, a, he's a civil rights lawyer in South Alabama now. And another one, friend, close friend of mine, she's liberal. She works for the Democratic Party in Washington, D.C. But other, the, most of the rest of them were, were pretty conservative. And um, I wonder how I got out of this. And my hypothesis is um, that... I had an interesting genetic constitution <clears throat> because my uh, part of my family was Native American. And so Native American uh, in North Alabama, Cherokee. And so those folks had the local immunity uh, to the infectious diseases that were endemic to that region, the Native Americans. So I got that genetic complement. And I also got the European genetic complement, which had pretty good immunity to lots of respiratory diseases. And that's another story <laughs> we could work on. Um, but um, so I got this, this odd genetic complement, Native American plus Northern European, the Thornhills and Northern European. And that that reduced my interaction with infectious disease growing up. So like, unlike the kids around me, I didn't have all those ear, ear infections. I didn't have all those eye infections growing up. And um, unlike most of my friends. And so I think that's it, because I think that's part of the ontogeny, the, the developmental background of the values. That is, you're going through, you're, going, you're growing up, and how often is your immune system activated? And how long is your immune system activated when it's activated? That's part of the uh, developmental background uh, that we propose for, for values. If your immune system is activated a lot, then you end up conservative. If it's not, you end up liberal. So I, I think all that is, is uh, part of my interest in, <laughs> in this too. <laughs> yeah. If I'd been born somewhere else, maybe I'd have never gotten interested in values than in the old South, you know? Well, I think that's a really good place to end. I don't want to end because there's like 50 other things I'd like to ask you, but that's it's been great that's, talking with you. Well, yeah. thank you. And it's so interesting. Your research is, is like I said, it's too interesting, actually. You suggested some good experiments too. I'm going to think about it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, they're, 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 they're causal experiments and, yeah. and they're all actually relatively straightforward. I'm supposed so, to be retired now. Uh, and, uh, but I'm trying to do this, this, uh, popular science book and that's no, it'd, be, it'd also be interesting to see if there's any relationship between even self-reported prevalence of amount of time ill during childhood and adolescence and trait openness there there is a there is a scientific study of of illness two studies of illness during childhood reported illness during childhood is one of the studies and conserve some some components of conservatism. I don't remember if the openness is there, but some, and that works. And then there's another one where they had uh, they looked at actually health records uh, of children who then became adults. You have adults, and then you have mm -hmm. their health records, and they did that and showed that the uh, uh, less health the kid had as a ch as a child, the more conservative they were. Uh, mm -hmm. later. There's a study that, so that kind of that kind of stuff is out there. Yeah. So then, okay, so maybe we could we could let me ask you what you think about this. When I first came across your work, I thought, is it possible that the human race could rescue itself from the worst excesses of the kind of conservatism that degenerates into malevolent fascism, essentially by wiping out infectious disease? I think the answer to that is straightforward. Yes. Jesus, um, that's... Yeah, 
Absolutely. Uh, the, uh, you know, I want to emphasize that so, the parasite stress theory of values, parasite stress theory of values and sociality is a scientific theory. And hence, it doesn't have any, doesn't make any moral judgments about, you know, it doesn't say conservatism is more moral than liberalism or vice versa. Scientific theory, no, no value judgments involved there because it's scientific theory. But if one wanted to change the values of the future of people, uh, the, then you have to know, of course, what the causes of the of values are. That's the way you change things. You know, the, you know, causes of things, and you can change them. Then, uh, you, if you wanted to make the world more liberal, uh, you would reduce infectious disease. Well, you could you say, let's imagine you wanted, you wanted to make the world a place where the cost for the free exchange of ideas and people was dramatically reduced, so that the countervailing tendency to that was unnecessary. Yeah. And, and the catastrophes that might go along with an excess of that countervailing proclivity. The most yeah. effective way forward would be to eradicate infectious right. disease. And so, right. and then you'd have the benefit of eradicating the disease, which would be non-trivial, plus yeah. you'd have the political benefit. People would be healthier, lower morbidity, and uh, healthier throughout their lives. And uh, also, they'd be open and, uh, you know, sort of the, reaching the goal of the true enlightenment, which was all about, you know, freedom of thought and individuality, um, science, uh, knowledge, all that stuff. Right. All and, entirely and, laudable goals, except yeah. when the cost becomes too high. Yeah, when diseases are out there. Well, yeah. so I've been talking to people like Bjorn Lomberg and Matt Ridley and the and and yeah. and I know. you know, they're they're people who have a, a positive enlightenment view of the future and are having a hard time in some sense, along with the rest of us, generating something like what would you say, a noble vision for the future that moderates could get behind and be motivated by. And it certainly yeah. seems in light of this discussion that and of what's happened with COVID-19, et cetera, and the fact that infectious diseases are still a primary killer, and not only that, crippler of people all around the world, and that they contribute radically to all sorts of political instability, that one thing we could all agree on would be that less infectious diseases would be better. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And, um, you know, I have a pretty positive view of the future. Like, you, you've, you've, uh, I noticed on your uh, website that you interviewed Steve Pinker. Yep. Buddy. He, he's um, in the same group in some sense as these other people that I just mentioned. You know, they're, they're optimistic enlightenment figures. Yeah, I, I can be optimistic. And, 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 and he, he's, he has data on how much things have improved over the yep. last several centuries. And that's because of lower infectious disease. I mean, he doesn't have a theory. Uh, his, was, his, his idea is basically just stops it. Hell, things people got enlightened, but how come they got enlightened? You know, why did the enlightenment occur? And, um, and why, why did we allow it to occur? Yeah, that's, exactly. Right? That's did, the real why issue. Did it, Absolutely, things get yeah. better and better. Why did why did mortality and you know uh, homicides and wars and all that reduce in frequency? And uh, all the evidence we put together says it has to do with lower infectious disease through time. That's what happened. That's what's behind that trend. That's why that's 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 the key to our better angels. Thank you very much. Sure, I really appreciate you. it. It was a great discussion. I really I learned a lot, and I, your work is really be, it's remarkable. Sure. Anytime, if you want to talk. Hey, about yeah, well, uh, <laughs> I may call on may well call on you again. <laughs>